I'm going to introduce uh, Steve Adler, who's going to introduce uh, another board member from the New York City Civil Liberties, and they're going to talk about the Economic Justice Jam. So, Steve, thanks for coming up today. Uh, good morning. Good morning. 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 <laughs> That's what I want to hear. Let me hear that again. Good morning. Good morning. That's great. Thank you very much for uh, Noel. Great to be here, second time uh, at Beta NYC for International Open Data Day. I'm Steve Adler. I'm Chief Data Strategist at IBM. I work with governments around the world on open data and data strategy. And I'm here today to ask you for your help. Because today we're going to be working together on an area of open data and civic activism that doesn't get a lot of attention. For most of us in the civic tech space, we are educated, we are from the middle class or more, we have resources, and we can uh, work with information. But the area that we're not really reaching are people who are of lower income. The civic tech space is not really reaching this class of people. If you're poor, if you don't have money, if you don't have an education, you don't have resources, you don't know anything about open data, and you don't know anything about civic tech. And so today we're organizing the Economic Justice Jam to try to bring some civic tech leadership to people in the United States, especially in New York City and in New York State, who don't have access to our resources, to try to build, to collect some data, to try to shine a light on um, laws and practices and ordinances which disadvantage people every day, um, and their stories are not often told. Like an example, two weeks ago I was in San Francisco. I don't know if you read this story about a young hipster. Uh, some people are laughing, they heard this story. There's a young hipster who published some tweets on Twitter about how inconvenient it was that while his parents were in town for the Valentine's Day weekend, he had to step over some homeless people on the street. And he wrote, you know, why is it that when we had a Super Bowl, we were able to sweep the streets of all this Riffraff was what the words he used. And we can't keep the streets clean every day because sort of the, the entitled attitude that, well, you know, we're paying for this city, we're, the city, the tech scene is really supporting the city. Why do we have to put up with these people on the street? As if homelessness was their fault. As if somehow um, we didn't have to pay attention to the poorest members of our society and figure out why they got there. And what occurred to me in that that dialogue was a total lack of empathy. And the lack of empathy comes because the stories are not often told about how people become homeless. You know, they're not, contrary to popular belief, they don't choose that way of life. They often get there because we have laws and rules that, uh, in which failure and mistakes are paid for with extremely high prices. And we don't have a lot of tolerance in our society for failure and for mistakes, and so if you, any one of us can be just a few degrees of separation away from that way of life. And in order to shine a light on those stories of real people who live in our midst, we want to collect some data. I think thanks to the laws in New York City and the state, for the first time in the history of our nation, we have some data sets available to us that, if combined, could help tell the story of how people end up in situations like that, how they're disadvantaged every day by the rules that we've created in our society. And so we ask your help, data scientists, please work with, do you guys know what NICLU is? I'm gonna use NICLU. Do you know what the New York Civil Liberties Union is? How many, who knows what it is? That is not enough people. We are a branch of the American Civil Liberties Union and we are here to protect your civil rights. And economic justice is one of your civil rights. So if you don't know about us, we want you to come and join us for the Economic Justice Jam and find out how you can work to protect your civil rights and the civil rights of your citizens. Robin Wilner is the chairman of our board. I'm a board member of the NICLU, and Robin is here to tell you more about why you should participate with us in the Economic Justice Jam. Thank you. Okay. We need rights for short people over here. Okay. Can you? <laughs> Thank
Thank you. Much better. OK. Thank you, Steve. It was great to hear his passion about these issues. I know m most of you, all of you out here, feel this, the same way. And we want to shine a light on these very important issues. Um, in my day job, I work on public education for folks who want to talk about that later. I'm also a recovering IBMer, another long story. But what I am so proud to be doing now in New York City is to be the president of the board of the New York Civil Liberties Union. And I also want to recognize Wendy Stryker, who put a lot of work into this. Thank you, who's our vice president and my great colleague. And we have another board member, Peter Gollin, is here from our board. Somewhere, raise your hand. And throughout the day, you're going to meet some more staff people and board members for the New York Civil Liberties Union. But before we, we talk about the jam, I do want to tell you some more things about the New York Civil Liberties Union and why what we're doing for you and why we need you. So again, who? I'm proud to be a card-carrying member of the New York Civil Liberties Union. Who else is? OK, thank goodness. We got a couple of folks here. Great. How many of you have read an article, or you saw a blog, or somebody tweeted you about the New York Civil Liberties Union, or you were at a demonstration, and like last year, the, the big Earth Day demonstration for the environment, and you saw folks with big NYCLU signs protecting your right to demonstrate. And you thought, yeah, you, you thought, I need to find out more about that. And I'm busy, and I don't have time, but I need to find out more about that. Well, I'm going to save you some time, and I'll tell you about it right now. So as Steve said, we are the New York affiliate of the American Civil Liberties Union. And our goal is simple, but I'm going to read it to make sure I get it absolutely right. We are here to defend and protect the fundamental principles and values that are embodied in the Bill of Rights, the US Constitution, and the New York State Constitution. And what are those values? Well, there are a lot of them that we care about. We care about economic justice. We care about freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom to assemble. Your right to privacy is one of the things that we fight for. And assurance that you have equality under the law and due process under the law. So if all of those things are already embodied in the Bill of Rights, the US Constitution, the New York State Constitution, what are we making so much noise about? Well. Because embodied in an abstract way doesn't deliver it for you. And our job is to make sure that those rights are reality. Because you can ex access them every day. You can exercise them every day. And no matter who you are, you get access to those rights. And as Steve said, whether you are disadvantaged, whether you look different, whether you, your faith is different, whether you dress differently, we want to make sure you have access to all of those rights. So let me give you a couple of examples so you know who we are and what we've done. So until several years ago, the most that the federal government thought they should do for the defense of marriage in this country, there was a law, right? The Defense of Marriage Act. Because the US Congress thought the way to protect marriage and families is to debase those marriages among same-sex people, not to recognize them and not to provide benefits. And one day, a woman named Edie Windsor, remember that name? Windsor. Oh, right. applause. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Who's now in her 80s and is an amazing woman. And she had a long-term, beautiful, committed relationship, eventually was able to marry her partner, who died, unfortunately, after a very long illness. And after decades of being together, and her wife dies, and she gets slapped with a huge tax bill inheritance tax bill that no wife or husband ever has to pay. But because we're defending marriage, we wanted Edie to pay it. And Edie, like people before her, because individuals, whether it's Rosa Parks or Edie Windsor, one day just say, no, enough. I'm not going to do it. And that's, that is courage, and that is how we change the world. But it's not enough to say no. You have to get something done. And that's where the New York Civil Liberties Union came in and they worked with Edie to make her voice loud, to make her case, and to take that case all the way to the Supreme Court. And as we all know, they then overturned that heinous and discriminatory law. And then a year later, our Supreme Court finally understood, and they made marriage equality the law of the land. Yes. But that's not enough. Because what 
we know at the New York Civil Liberties Union is that you have to be vigilant. And just last year, there was a couple, two women who were planning to get married. What a wonderful event in New York where gay marriage is absolutely legal. And they went to rent the venue. They found the perfect place to have their wedding. It was in Albany. It was beautiful. It had a view. It was everything they had always dreamed of. And the owner said, oh, no, not you. I'm sorry. I don't agree with the Supreme Court. I don't agree with the law of the land. No, you cannot rent this venue for your And again, it was the NYCLU that came forward. And just this January, courts in New York made very clear this is the law of the land. And it's not only the abstract law that we have marriage equality. It is something you can access and exercise. And if you're in business, then do your business and rent to whoever wants to use your facility. One an important case, and we made it a reality. This is just one example. What else do we do? Well, here's something you've all have heard about, stop and frisk. Everybody in New York knows about stop and frisk, and we know how horrible it is, right? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> but most of us started talking about stop and frisk, oh, in 2012, 2013. Well, I want you to know stop and frisk was the standard operating procedure of the NYC Police Department back in 2004, when over 100,000 people were being stopped. In 2004, we went over 300,000. Oh, in 2006, we like to use that in this crowd, right? In 2006, the number went over a half million. But people weren't talking about it. Well, there were certainly a lot of people who knew about stop and frisk. They knew about it every day, OK? And then I'm getting that, I got to wrap up. So, um, but this is an area where data ma mattered because, as we heard before, just because data is required doesn't mean we have access to it. And it was the New York Civil Liberties Union who went out, filed that FOIL request, insisted that we get the data, got data that was totally indecipherable, put it together, and made sure that we knew that it was not right to have 686,000 people stop. It's not right if 87% of them were black and Latino, if 51% of them were young people between 14 and 24, and my favorite stat, I've got to use a stat here, right? 88% of them were totally innocent. Well, we made that an issue, and we're making progress. This last year, 22,000 people were stopped, and that's still too many, and we still want to do work with the police every day. We could talk about a lot of issues. I don't have time to do that. We're all going to get together later and talk about education, talk about access to the, to the um, criminal justice system, talk about other inequities. We want to make sure that you are with us. But I want to say two last things quickly, which is for those, those of you who say, well, I understand about the disadvantage you don't have access. I understand about people of different faiths who don't have access to freedom of religion. And I understand that my rights are safer when everybody's rights are secure. I get that. And I understand that any day I'm just one minute away from being in one of those disadvantaged populations, so I want my rights secure. But I want you to understand that this is not just about doing good. This is not just about feeling good about helping others. This is about your rights, everybody here. Anybody here have an iPhone? <laughs>
Over a thousand times that's happened because the New York Civil Liberties Union got a foil request through. We got that data. This is the data that John was talking about. Everything's not open because there's a new law. We have to be vigilant. We have to get the data. And we are going to make sure that you all are protected. So come join us. We want to help you. We can't do it without you. And we look forward to the jam. Done.